been put up. Otherwise, welcome to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And this is part 31 of our study of the Bodhisattva Aksaya Mati uh, Bodhisattva Sutra. Uh, we've been doing a many week long study of the Bodhisattva path. We've learned a lot about the different stages of Bodhisattva development and the various practices of the Bodhisattva. And last Sunday, we we got to the last set of teachings of this sutra. This is the uh, last set of, it's actually not the last set of 10, but for all intents and purposes, this is the last set of correspondences to our stages. And these are these elusive, mysterious dharani that we are told towards the end of the Aksayamati Bodhisattva Sutra, we're told that the Bodhisattva in this development of Buddhahood, in this development of the Bodhisattva path, they enter these different stages. And upon entering, or actually the text says, being in that stage. So it's not about uh, entering the stage. It's not about leaving the stage. It's actually about being in each of the stages. The Bodhisattva attains these 10 Dharanis. And, you know, I had a lot of preliminary remarks about Dharanis, this idea of uh, mnemonic devices, even magic spells and ideas like that. I had a lot to say about that last week. So please refer to part 30 for the introduction to Dharanis. This is part two. I have a lot to say, so I'm gonna, in a way, dive right back in. Um, as usual though, if any, at any point it's confusing or you have questions or even ideas, please, please interrupt. Otherwise, I'm gonna dive right back in um, to discussing these Dharanis. Um, so the first thing I want to remind you is, is that this sutra, the uh, Bodhisattva Sayamati Sutra, which is part of the Ratna Kuta collection, this is an anthology, a collection of sutras. In this sutra, the this is I chose this sutra. I told you a long time ago because it's such a detailed explanation of the whole Bodhisattva path. And these 10 Dharanis that we're gonna discuss uh, tonight are considered Samapati. They're considered attainments of the Bodhisattva. And I gave a lot of ideas about what that means last week. So again, I don't wanna repeat it tonight, but what I do wanna to start tonight by saying is that these Dharanis they become a very big part of Buddhism. Um, in, in other words, if you're sort of uh, more historically minded, you know, a sutra like this, a sutra like Bodhisattva Sayamati, you know, is a Mahayana Buddhist sutra that probably originated in the world, you know, probably around 100 BC maybe late, as late as 100 AD, but it's definitely old, very old, but it's not as old as Buddhism. You know, Buddhism goes back to probably around 500 BC, and it's during, of course, the lifetime of the Buddha that you get the initial sutras that are preserved in the Pali language, the suttas, and a sutra, a sutra like this, talking about Dharanis and Bodhisattva stages and all of this, this is probably coming from about four or 500 years after the Buddha. Probably, this, these are generalizations based on modern scholarly research in that way. But what I mean to say is, is that the Dharanis, as they are described and explained in a sutra like this, these are the, this is the very early 
beginnings of a Durrani tradition, if I could say that, that then becomes a very, very big part of Buddhism. And so what I mean is, is that if you are familiar with Vajrayana Buddhism, otherwise known as esoteric or tantric Buddhism, most uh, kind of formally represented by the Tibetan Buddhist traditions, plural, multiple, but most forms of Tibetan Buddhism are very Vajrayana. They're very magical in that sense. They're very tantric. And so a big part of Tibetan Buddhism, a big part of Vajrayana, it are these Dharanis. But, you know, Tibetan Buddhism, Vajrayana, esoteric Buddhism, you know, if you read uh, certain scholarly books about it, they will say that this esoteric Vajrayana type of Buddhism kind of originated around four or 500 AD. Oh, so what I'm getting at is, is that the way that the Dharanis are described in this sutra, this is the very early days of Dharanis. This is the very early days of this practice that becomes much more a part of Buddhism. And in some traditions, like Tibetan Vajrayana, it becomes a very, very big part of the tradition. In other words, you know, I'm, I want to spend a lot of time on these Dharanis, not necessarily because of Bodhisattva Aksayamati and this sutra, but because Dharanis are a big part of Buddhism. And I kind of want you to know where they come from, what are the origin traditions of these things. And then tonight, I hope to sort of bring us kind of to the modern world of Buddhism in that way, or at least modern Vajrayana practice. So that might be a, a high goal for tonight to go all the way to the modern period, but that's what we're talking about. And so what I mean to say is, is that in this sutra, these 10 Dharanis that are described, they are described as attainments of the Bodhisattva. <clears throat> as the Bodhisattva is moving up the stages, they are having visions, we discussed the 10 visions of the Bodhisattva. They are perfecting paramitas. We discussed the practices or the virtues of a Bodhisattva. They are attaining samadhis. And we discussed these meditative states or these samadhis of the Bodhisattva. And now at the end of the sutra, the Bodhisattva attains these dharanis. And I ended last class by <clears throat> giving you a, a variety of ways of understanding these Dharanis. Yes, they are connected to language and syllables and speech. And that's sort of how these Dharanis become synonymous with magic spells and things like that. Incantations, mantras, recitations, prayers. That's how that happens. But the original idea of these Dharanis as a samapatti, as an attainment of the Bodhisattva, as I said last time, there's a lot of indication that these Dharanis are kind of mnemonic devices. They're, they're kind of like upaya in that way. They're little, uh, little tricks, little devices, <clears throat> little techniques. But Dharanis are always associated linguistically and otherwise. They're always associated with memory, remembering things. And I mentioned last, uh, last week that there's like a Dharani, an incantation that you can recite to improve your memory. And that's kind of a, a, a combination of these ideas where Dharanis are about memory, but you could use a Dharani to improve your memory. And at the very kind of end of last session, I kind of laid out this really interesting idea that I want to return to quickly, just to sort of set the tone for tonight. 
because it's kind of a continuation of last week. I mentioned last week this idea of like, imagine that you had a really long poem that you wanted to memorize. And so you took the first letter of every word of that poem. And then you just had a long sequence of letters that represented the first letter of the word of each word. And then I mentioned that you could come up with a notation to indicate repetitions of those letters so that you would only have, you know, let's say it's a, a poem that never uses the letter Q, never let, uses the letter Z. You know, those are the, the kind of the oddball letters, right? So let's say you got it down to just like 23 or 24 letters that then you had a notation for the repetitions of those letters and that represented this whole poem. And then I mentioned this wild idea of that, that what if you then took the form of those letters, you know, the, the letter A and the letter B, and you kind of created a wild symbol that embodied all of those initial letters and all of those repetitions of those letters so that you could get it down to one, you know, granted it might be a little complicated, but it would be one emblem or like one symbol that represented that whole poem. Well, that condensation, that condensing of all that information, the whole poem to letters, the letters to just repetitions, all the way down to just a single letter, single symbol. Well, that single symbol is kind of related to a Durrani in that way. It's kind of what a Durrani, you know, remember that word dar means to hold, the, the root, the etymology of this word is to have or to hold. And so you could think of this Durrani as containing, Duranis are often considered containers in that way, that, that symbol contains contains that whole poem. Now, the idea though, that I wanted to, to pick back up on that I mentioned last week, right at the end, what I mentioned was that there's a way that if you already knew that poem, you could use that emblem or that symbol to then sort of jar your memory and you could unlock the whole poem, but you would need to have known the poem originally. And so what I said last week was, is that if you didn't know the poem, then that symbol or that emblem would just be like a kind of a mysterious symbol. And you wouldn't know how to read it. You wouldn't know how to unpack it. And I wanted to return to that point because what I said last week was that's sort of the the beginning of the esoteric hidden nature of Durrani's. It's not that they are secret. It's that the way that they operate is in a kind of secret, almost cryptographic way in that way. And of course, that slight esoteric, by which I mean hidden, that slight hidden nature to Durrani's is definitely what leads them down the road towards full-on magical esotericism in that way. But again, I'm kind of starting with just the, the beginning of this, which is the way Durrani's are described in the sutra, right? So that's what we're kind of heading towards is the more, the, like what I want to kind of talk about tonight is how do Durrani's become magic spells? How do they move from becoming, being an attainment of the Bodhisattva that demonstrates their, basically their knowledge and memory of the Dharma, their knowledge and memory of the teachings. How does that turn into this like magical spell stuff, right? That's kind of what we're talking about tonight. And the main goal of tonight is to um, talk about the 10 Dharanis that are associated with the 10 stages in the Sutra. And 
I want to do that for a few different reasons, but I just have a few more general remarks about Durrani's to make. And so the first one, which I don't, I wanted to make this last week, it kind of fit more in with last week's um, talk. So I want to put this out there now. And I kind of, I do this be at the beginning because I want us to start thinking dharmically as it were, kind of thinking in, in a different way. And well, what I want to address is that originally these Durrani's, they, they definitely seem to have been, like I said last week, they're definitely about syllables. And what I mean by that is that they are about phonetics. Okay, they, it becomes associated with scripts, certain scripts, certain writing forms. But in the er early days, the, these Durrani's are strictly uh, phonetic in that sense. And, in, and what we mean is that they are spoken, not written. And so I think there's a lot to be, I think there's a lot to be explored about Durrani's. And so I'm not saying this um, definitively about Durrani's, but I am, I wanna make a statement about speech. Um, so there, yeah, this is really tricky, but it's a really interesting idea and I don't have anywhere else to espouse these ideas, frankly. So what it is, is, is that, you know, there's a kind of a, there is a, um, a remnant of the past in our language. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, we're, we are modern, we, we, we operate in text almost as equally as we operate in phonetical speech in that way in the modern world. We text a lot, we email a lot. And so our relationship to language is a modern one. And so I just want to remind you or inform you, because maybe you've never heard this, but there's a lot of ideas, of course, about linguistics, about language, and about the function of language. And without opening up a huge can of ideas about this, I just want to talk about one idea, and that's what would be called, well, it has a, these technical ideas in, in, philosophy of language. And the technical idea would be called a speech act or a performative speech act. What I'm getting at is, is that, um, actually, let me, I'm gonna try, let me see. So this is one of my favorite living philosophers, writers and thinkers, is an Italian writer, thinker, philosopher named uh, Giorgio Agamben. Um, this is his name, Giorgio Agamben. And he's a really, really brilliant thinker in a, a variety of ways. And he has a large uh, project called Homo Sucker. It's a multi-book project that unless you are familiar with it, don't even worry about it. But one of this book that's part of that series is called The Sacrament of Language in Archaeology of the Oath. And it's a study of language and kind of the history of language in a way and the way language is used. And I want to just read to you because I couldn't, I couldn't actually think of a better way to say it. So I just want to read it. But he's talking about a kind of archaic form of the use of language that we only have remnants of in the modern world. We have slight traces of it. And what he's talking about in this book is, the, is an oath, like taking an oath, like putting your hand on a Bible, at least that's the Western convention, and saying, I swear dot, 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 right? Or another example is a wedding vow where do you so-and-so take so-and-so to do such and such? And you would say, I do. So that's an oath in that way. And 
what's interesting about that speech act of saying I do or I swear, and that now I'm going to read directly from Agamben, is that so he's just gotten done with a whole section of talking about this aspect of language. And so he says that it's in this perspective that one must reread the theory of performatives or what are called speech acts, which in the thought of the 20th century represent a sort of enigma, he says, as if philosophers and linguists were coming up against a magical stage of language. He says the speech act, such as I do or I swear, is a linguistic enunciation that does not describe a state of affairs, but immediately produces a fact and actualizes its very meaning. I swear is in this sense the perfect paradigm of a speech act. So that's a really heavy idea right there, but it's this idea, and he's, he's drawing on a whole history of uh, philosophy of language, by the way. But what he's talking about, and it's what I wanna talk about right now, is he's drawing a distinction between language as describing something versus a language being an immediate, performance of what is being described. A very, very subtle distinction. But I saw a number of heads nodding, and that's awesome that if you, if you get that distinction, and what is related to this, actually, it has a lot to do with this book, um, is that there's a whole kind of world of the study of religion and anthropology that basically kind of recognizes that the names of gods, for example, that you might evoke when swearing, that these names in a very kind of archaic early world, the names of deities and gods and these things, they weren't descriptors, they were the god themselves like that the name, the enunciation was the deity. And therefore to announce the name of the deity was to literally evoke the deity, like literally not <laughs> refer to, but that, that the name, the calling of the name and the God were synonymous, right? If you're kind of following me on that, it's my feeling that Durrani's function in a very similar way, where they're not descriptors of things, they are speech acts. And to actually enunciate the mantra or the Durrani, it's a performative speech act in that way. And if you could kind of get into that idea, then good, because that's kind of setting the tone for tonight. Any questions about that before I proceed though, because that's kind of a heavy idea. Cool. Oh, Jimmy. Yeah, just real quick, quickly. Oh. I, I want you to once more make that link between the, the speech act of swearing a vow, because that's, seems pretty obvious it's it's the difference between speech as an adjective and speech as a verb an actual thing that you're that's being done with the speech and how that relates to the to the difference between the name of the god being a description of the god as opposed to naming the god mm -hmm. being the invocation of the or maybe something even deeper than the invocation of the god it is actually the god can you mm -hmm. just yep i can try i can do my best in that way without so the, time. <laughs> so if we go back to the idea of the the oath or a vow or something like that you know when when the um when the what do they call it the officiant when the officiant asks do you 
take so-and-so to be your such and such. And you say, I do. There is a kind of a, 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 a very profound um, meeting point between speech and reality in that way. Because you are not saying like, I will in the future. You're saying, I, I do. Like that saying it is the doing of it because that's actually what a vow is about in that way. So that is the segue to this subtle idea of, a, of an, that there was an understanding in the ancient world seemingly that a god or a deity and the name of that god and that deity were the same thing. It wasn't that the name was like, like for example, uh, Jimmy, the idea is, well, there's a god and you could call it Bob or you could call it this or you could call it that or you could call, no, 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 no. Like the actual Yahweh, like for example, in the Hebrew tradition, this annunciation is the deity. And that's where you get into a heavy thing about not using the Lord's name in vain kind of ideas. Like, because to say it is to actually evoke, not just evoke it. I, I'm using evoke a different way, but it's not just to allude to it. It's to actually bring it into the room in that sense. And I just wanted to say those things to get us thinking about language a certain way so that we can be thinking of Durrani's that way as not describing something, not even maybe necessarily being information in that sense, but it actually being a speech act. Cool. Um, uh, by the way, yeah. So here's my segue to us getting into a deeper conversation about the specific 10 Durrani's that go along with this. So in a sutra like uh, tonight's, you know, we've had a lot of fun. We've been a lot of different places. We've talked about this. We've talked about that. We've talked about paramitas. We've talked about samadhis. And like right at the end here, the bodhisattva is receiving these dharanis or attaining these dharanis. And, you know, if you read, for example, like if you read the Lotus Sutra, 28 chapters, I think it's around chapter 25 or 26. It's a chapter of Durrani's. <laughs> it's a whole chapter, just a bunch of Durrani's that are Lotus Sutra Durrani's. If you, if you study a lot of Mahayana Sutras, you will notice at the end, there starts to be Durrani's. It's kind of a, kind of a feature of Mahayana Sutras. Some have more, some have less. But what actually starts to happen is, is that you start to get a whole genre of sutras emerging that are nowadays we call them Durrani sutras. And there's actually even within the Mahayana tradition, something called the Durrani Pitaka. And so if you're familiar with the Pitakas, the baskets, the Durrani sutras got to be so many, they, they created a whole basket just for the Durrani sutras. So again, these Dharanis really took over Buddhism and a real history of Dharanis needs to be written. It has yet to be written. I do wanna mention this book. Um, I was telling Noam about it earlier. This book by Paul Kopp, it's a scholarly study of Dharanis in medieval China, but it's really one of the best studies of Dharanis. I mean, it was published in like really recently, I forget when, 2014, so fairly recently, it's a very good academic study of Durrani's. He goes into the whole history of them, the Indian history and all of that. While we're talking sources, by the way, I wanna mention two books. One is this book by Ronald Davidson called Indian Esoteric Buddhism, a social history of the tantric movement. This is the best study of the origins of tantric or esoteric Buddhism in India. Um, cannot recommend this more. And a complement to that is Ryochi Abe's The Weaving of Mantra. And that's his name, Abe. 
And this is the best study of esoteric Buddhism in East Asia. If you have these two books, you have uh, uh, your work cut out for you, but those are the two best studies of the origin of esoteric Buddhism. Again, the real history of all of this really needs to be written. These are studies in that sense. Um, so I just want you to know that what you're getting tonight is, you know, the best I can do given the sources and the current state of the field, so to speak. Yeah, no. Does the, 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 does the tantras coming at the end of the sutra, toward the end of the sutra, have to do with them being a mnemonic for, for remembering the sutra or? Probably. I, yeah. Probably. I haven't, that's my feeling. I haven't seen anybody explicitly say that, but I think your assumption is, that's my assumption as well. Absolutely. And, and by the way, too, I just want to remind you from, I think I said this last week, you know, but if you look at the Heart Sutra as a case example, you know, the Heart Sutra, this very short, simple Pranyaparamita Sutra, it also has the sutra, and then at the end is where you get the dharani, or mantra as it's called. So even the Heart Sutra follows the format that Noam just asked about, which is the dharani coming at the end to somehow encapsulate or embody the whole sutra. So, yep. Um, all right, so we are about to dive into these 10 uh, specific dharanis. And, you know, all of these preliminary remarks were to, you know, instigate thought regarding these. But so, you know, be, feel free to bring up anything I've said when we get into these. Um, so I already mentioned that the whiteboard in the chat room that Gnome posted actually has all these listed. Um, it, it's a little too convoluted, so I didn't want to have it as my background, but if you'd like to look at it. Otherwise, I'm going to start with this one that I do have up. This is called the Sudarshana Adishtana Dharani. This is the first one. And what I actually want to start with is this is a good, uh, let's just start with this one, get into it, break it down. We'll start moving through the other ones more quickly. But so here's the way it looks in Chinese. And I already told you from here, that, sorry, that's the Chinese for tuo luo ni, which is just the way the Chinese transliterated de ran ni. So that's the tuo luo ni. However, in the text, it says shu sheng jia chi. And if you read Chinese, you would know, you would actually be able to read that. It actually says rare, and then this is a really interesting Buddhist idea that I want to get into tonight for a little bit, but this is called jia chi. Jia chi is, well, a very interesting idea. But what I'm getting at is, is that the first layer of these Dharanis is that they are understood, at least classically they are understood, to be phonetic, meaning that they are, they, that the sound is important. And so there's a way in which that this, uh, these tenderanis are already occulted. And that word occulted sort of means uh, hidden, obscured, right? Um, like the moon is oculated, right? During an eclipse in that way. But the idea is, is that that oculation or that obscuring, it already happens in that, at least in the Chinese, they translate the beginning part of the Durrani. And so it actually is understood very implicitly that the reader of this sutra, well, you know, depending on what language you're starting in, whether we're starting in English, whether we're starting in Chinese, either way, it's implicitly understood that we need to back translate this to Sanskrit. In, in other words, I've trans like trans 
related, I've brought this Durrani back to the Sanskrit, even though the Chinese wouldn't say this, but it says it in Chinese. I, I know this is getting complicated, but what I mean is this Durrani was probably the Sudarshana Adhisthana Durrani. Okay, that's like the, the sound that the Bodhisattva should be making when they attain this Durrani, when they understand this Durrani. Now, the beginning part of that, Sudarshana, Darshan in Sanskrit, Darshan means to, to view or to gaze in that, uh, to gaze upon something in that way. But Sudarshana means uh, rare to find, hard to see, but not hard to see like that it's like hard. It's just, it's very rare to come upon such a sight. That is Sudarshana. And then the other side of this is Adhisthana. And there's a lot of hidden information in this first Durrani. So this first Durrani corresponds to the first Bodhisattva stage. The first stage of great joy corresponds to the first paramita of dana or giving or generosity. And it's very important to remember that the first stage is about generosity or giving in that way. And I say that because the word adhisthana is, it's actually a word I've been researching all week, actually for like the last two weeks, I've been really interested in this word adhisthana. The word literally has something to do with a, with a um, kind of like our stages in that sense. They have to do with a, um, a base in a sense, a foundation in a sense, but it's really, really complicated. I, I actually probably shouldn't even spend this much time on it, but here's the thing though. So, in the world of Vajrayana, in the world of esoteric Buddhism, um, which includes actually, of course, not just Tibetan esoteric traditions, this includes Japanese esoteric Buddhist traditions, Chinese, but in the world of esoteric Buddhism, there is an idea, and that idea is Adhisthana. that word gets translated a lot of different ways, depending on the tradition. In fact, I wanna share this with you. It's another uh, good reference if you're interested in esoteric Buddhism. This is a Japanese esoteric Buddhist book. So this is empowerment, you know, it's a good book. I wouldn't necessarily recommend you try to find it, especially cause it's kind of hard to find. But it's just called Kaji, Empowerment and Healing in the Esoteric Buddhist Tradition or in Esoteric Buddhism. And I tell you about this because in Japanese, Jia Chi is pronounced kai, Kaiji. And they translate this idea of Jia Shi, this idea of Adhisthana, as empowerment. And indeed, within the esoteric Buddhist tradition, there is a lot about empowerment, being receiving empowerment, whether it's the empowerment of the Buddha, the empowerment from a guru, a Rinpoche. It's a big idea of empowerment. But as I've translated it here, it's also a word that can mean blessing. You know, blessing right? We say, I say it as if it's just so like, duh. But what I mean is, is that there's something in the Buddhist tradition. Adhisthana is a very old Buddhist idea. And it has to do with, well, my goodness, well, it has to do with empowerment. It has to do with blessings. It has to do with, um, well, 
I could tell you a lot of things about Adishtana. There's a way in which Adishtana, this word, originally actually kind of seemingly referred to a, uh, you know, I, it might have been a mound of earth, or it might have been a structure, a platform. But the Adishtana was about the platform or the area in which a monk or a nun or even a lay person was sort of initiated, brought into the Sangha and sort of received blessings or initiation or empowerment or something like that. So I'm being vague because this word Adishtana is used a lot of different ways in Buddhism. In the early days, it seems to have referred to this sort of initial initiation ceremony being brought into the Sangha. But by the time you get all the way to full on esoteric Buddhism, it's about blessings, uh, transferences of merit, empowerment rituals, all kinds of other stuff. I'm not exactly sure, you know, um, which we should go with in that sense, like what is exactly being spoken about here. But I do think that what is being referenced here with Adishtana is a kind of um, bestowal, shall we say, a bestowing of some, you know, again, what the bestowing could be, could be here's your robe and your bowl, right? Welcome to the club. Or it could be uh, like our Japanese tradition, actually, this book is a lot about healing, like kind of more very modern kind of new agey ideas about uh, ritual empowerments and healing in that way. So there's that. My point is, is that regardless of which one you go with, there's a way in which Adishtana relates very well with the idea of giving. It fits in very nicely with that idea. And so for the Bodhisattva abiding in the first Bhumi stage, the first stage of Bodhisattva development, for them to attain the Sudarshana Adishtana Dharani. That's what happens. And the question becomes, so do they... Yeah, exactly. It's like, so, <laughs> but I, I feel like you're equipped now to, to come up with your own decision about what is exactly going on there. So your guess is as good as mine. We know that bodhisattvas cultivating, developing enlightenment. We know they go through these stages and that upon abiding in the first stage, they attain this Dharani, that is, that could be translated as rare blessing or something to that effect. But let's keep in mind that it's actually about Sudarshana Adishtana. Like there's something about that sound potentially as well. Any questions about the first Dharani or how this is going to go? Because at this point, we're just going to go through all the rest of them. Okay, um, so again, from this point on, I'll ask you to refer to the whiteboard that's on the chat room that'll have all the rest of these. Otherwise, I'm just going to be announcing them. Uh, let me find my notes. Okay, so the second Dharani corresponding to the second Bhumi stage is called the Ajita Dharani. Ajita. And Ajita is a Sanskrit word that means invincible or inconquerable, okay? It's kind of interesting to note that the word Ajita is usually a title for Maitreya, the future coming Buddha. It's sort of, um, 
when in the Buddhist world, when you see the word ajitta, there's a sense in which you are, you know, it alludes to Maitreya in that way, but the word means invincible or un, uh, um, uh, invincible or unconquerable in that sense. And I want to remind you that this would then correspond to this second Bhumi stage, which corresponds to the paramita of moral discipline, right? Shila. And, you know, I think that there's a, a lot of ways that one, you know, you could make dharmic kind of philosophical relationships between uh, invincibility and uh, the practice of morality, in particular, the perfection of the practice of morality in that way. So I do think there is a way, either mnemonically or otherwise, that this does correspond to the teachings, the lessons of the sutra that we've been going through now for weeks and weeks and weeks. But I also, you know, am sensitive to, well, you know, sensitive to the the deeper possibilities here regarding language, which is to say, yeah, maybe this word means in invincible, but it's possibly also about this sound, ajita, in that sense. Yeah? Everybody ready for number three? Some of these are more, I have more to say about in a way than others. So if any catch your attention, please stop me. Otherwise, the third Dharani that the Bodhisattva attains upon entering this third stage is a very interesting idea. I've been actually searching for this one for a long time. Hold on one second. So, so this Dharani corresponds to our third stage here, right? And, you know, the third stage, the third paramita is about kashanti, patience, right? Patience is really the name of the Bodhisattva game in a lot of ways. And this, the word is, the Sanskrit word is supra Pista, S-U-P-R-A, T-I-S, but a sh, H-I-T-A, supratista. And this is a word, this is a Sanskrit word that I've been looking for for a very long time. I haven't, you know, uh, put forth the effort to find it, but in Chinese, it's a two character word that just means well abiding, right? And the classic word for abiding or the classic idea, of course, in Buddhism is this idea of abiding is sort of synonymous with meditation, a meditative state, abiding in a, in a dhyana. And so in Chinese, I often see this two character combination, well abiding, right? And there are many bodhisattvas that have this as part of their name. And I finally discovered in doing some, the back translation for tonight, I discovered that this in Sanskrit is supratista. Very, very interesting idea. It comes up now. I'm now, it's one of those words I'm starting to see everywhere. And it does have, of course, again, have to do with this sort of meditative state, this meditative calm well abiding, right? I feel like there was even maybe one other part of this sutra that touched upon this idea of well abiding. There's of course a lot of overlap, but you know, the idea here is if we could get into, um, if we could get into a little Dharma, right? You know, this idea of kashanti. Kashanti is the third paramita that corresponds to this stage. By the way, of course, this stage is about uh, radiance. Is that what I translated as? Yes, radiance, right? 
And the Bodhisattva becomes radiant in that sense when they abide in this third bhumi that is associated with kashanti. And, you know, this kashanti is, is a really profound idea in the Bodhisattva path. It doesn't get mentioned too much in the more Pali early tradition, but it becomes sort of bedrock. It's a bedrock of, of the Bodhisattva path. And, you know, it has to do with a kind of very chill attitude, frankly, very tranquil, but it has a lot to do with, you know, the main thing about Kishanti or patience is that it's about not getting worked up when say, you know, somebody's calling you names or what have you. And you might want to rush to defend your honor or rush to defend yourself in that sense. And there's a way in which the, the bodhisattva who's practicing patience is not disturbed is the idea. And there's a certain way, of course, where, well, that the bodhisattva that abides in this kashanti almost in a, in a way could become immovable, to use another Buddhist term, where they are not stirrable. And, you know, this also, so in regards to say, in regards to say the afflictions, the three afflictions of attraction, aversion, and confusion, otherwise known as greed, anger, and delusion. This kashanti, it's about not uh, developing anger, being very, very chill. Again, being very, uh, the bodhisattva is, is very, very hard to trigger if we could use the modern term in that way. And so the anger, the bodhisattva practicing kashanti does not generate anger. The bodhisattva practicing kashanti also doesn't outwardly desire and crave in that way. So there's no movement in this way. There's no movement in the defensive way. And then ultimately there is no confusion or delusion. And so the bodhisattva who practices and abides in that sense in this kashanti, well, they are said to be well abiding in that way. And, you know, let's see. I'll tell you where, just because it's a fun night, I will tell you a really, really good source for understanding well abiding the Supratishta, the best one is, let's see, it's an all-star sutra night. And one of my favorite sutras is from the middle length discourses. So this goes all the way back to the Pali tradition and it's sutra number, where'd you go? Uh, well, it begins as sutra number 131 in the middle length discourses. And this is called, in English, it's called a single excellent night. It's one of my favorite suttas in the world. And it actually is a series, it's a series of suttas that are all about this idea of a single excellent night. But it's because they all pertain to one little gatha, one little poem. And I want to just read you, it's just, it's tiny, so I want to read it to you, but it's a very, very good definition of supratista, this idea of well abiding. And the poem, reading it from the Wisdom Bhikkhu Nanamoli Bhikkhu Bodhi edition, reads something like this. Let not a person revive the past or on the future build their hopes. 
for the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Instead, with insight, let them see each presently arisen state. Let them know and let them be sure of it. Invincibly, unshakably, today the effort must be made. Tomorrow death may come. Who knows? No bargain with mortality can keep one, can keep Mara and his hordes away. But one who dwells thus ardently, relentlessly by day and by night, it is that one, the peaceful sages say, it is that one who has had a single excellent night. That's the end of the poem. That's it. Do you want me to read it again? <laughs> it's, uh, let not a person revive the past or on the future build their hopes for the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Instead, with insight, let them see each presently arisen state. Let them know it and be sure of it invincibly, unshakably. I'll leave it at that. That, I believe, is the origin of the definition of well-abiding. <laughs> that idea. And I think that that's a... And by the way, too, that poem, that's one of those little gothas, as they're called, one of those little poems that often it looked, because again, it appears in a bunch of different sutras or suttas. That poem looks like it's very old, like maybe even older than Buddhism in that way, because there's a, sometimes when the Buddha references, he references is the single excellent night gatha as if it was something he heard. So very old, profound wisdom there on the past is gone, the future has yet to arrive. So let, let one abide in this single excellent night. Yeah. Okay. So unexpected twist on well abiding. Didn't I didn't know I was going to do that, but it seemed right at the time. Number four, fourth Dharani. So the fourth Dharani corresponding to the fourth Bhumi stage the uh, refulgent or bright, as it's called, the fourth stage, is called Abhedatta, A-B-H-E-D-A-T-A. And that is Sanskrit for indestructible. So we've had Ajita, invincible, okay, inconquerable, Great. But now, after the well abiding, the Bodhisattva gets this Dharani that is the indestructible. Okay. This Dharani corresponds, of course, with the fourth paramita, which is virya or drive. And so there is a deep sense of energy, determination, vigor. Uh, that is associated with this paramita. But there's also sort of a very deep dharmic sense to the idea of indestructibility, to abedata, this idea. I've mentioned it a few times already, so I'll just say it. The esoteric, uh, tantric Buddhist tradition is often referred to as, and I've said it a few times tonight, it's referred to as the Vajrayana, the way of the Vajra. And of course, if you didn't know, this is a Vajra. You've probably seen one. This is the symbol of the thunderbolt lightning uh, weapon of the Indian god Indra. Indra is the god of the sky who wields a thunderbolt weapon. 
sometimes in a more uh, Hindu kind of um, artistic realm, the Vajra actually looks, the Vajra looks a lot like this you'll see images of like Vishnu where they'll have like a disc that doesn't look unlike a CD, uh, but on their finger and they're like, it's spinning. Well, in the Buddhist tradition, this, which is a Vajra, it's this kind of energy of a lightning bolt that the God Indra forms. In Buddhism, they stylize the Vajra to look like this and there'll be many versions of this. But, oh, nice, there's one. The idea of the Vajra though is, you know, yes, it's lightning or thunder in that way. But one of the qualities of the Vajra that the Buddhists are very interested in is its indestructibility. It's an aspect of Vajra. And it's kind of hard to kind of describe that indestructibility. Um, there's also this way in which indestructibility, it has to do with indivisibility. And without kind of, I just realized time has slipped away from us, right? Um, and I do kind of want to move through these, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the idea of indestructible is a very kind of interesting idea that's related again to indivisibility. And of course, divisibility means uh, the ability to be separated. And the idea of Vajra is that within the esoteric Buddhist tradition, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, Vajra, this sort of um, lightning, electricity type thing, it's considered the very nature of enlightenment, they say. And, you know, while that, that might be figurative in that sense, like that they're not actually talking about a physical substance of enlightenment, but a more metaphorical substance, there's an interesting way to think about Vajra as non-dualistic. And in fact, it cannot even be dualized. In other words, if you are in a subject-object relationship, if you are in a dualistic relationship, that's not Vajra. <laughs> when one is participating in a non-dual situation, call it a dhyana, call it a samadhi or what have you, when there is union, going back to samadhi in that way, but when there is that whole, that's closer to vajra in the sense of not being two, right? So, you know, whether this is, that whether this fourth dharani is alluding to vajra or not, I think the idea of indestructible does have to do with duality versus singularity or oneness in that way, but indestructible too, if you're a real Dharma head out there, and I know that you're out there, there is this really deep idea in Buddhism, of course, about conditioned and unconditioned Dharmas, Samskrita Dharmas and Asamskrita Dharmas, right? Conditioned dharmas is anything relative, anything conditional, anything dualistic, anything in this kind of diluted realm of division. Whereas the asamskrita, the unconditioned, that's like space, nirvana, that's the unconditioned, and there's a way in which the unconditioned is indestructible because it's the realm of the condition that can be broken down, right? So Abhidatta indestructibility, the Abhidatta Dharani, insofar as it means something, would seem to be pointing to this non-dual nature of enlightenment.
something to that effect, yeah? Number five. Number five is sort of interesting because we've encountered this before. So the Bodhisattva who's about to abide in the fifth stage that corresponds to dhyana, meditation in that sense, attains the dharani that is called the vimala dharani. And we've, we know about vimala, this is the word that means stainless or flawless in that sense, right? And vimala is of course, one of the stages. That's the second stage. But we also encountered vimala as it was one of the samadhis maybe, or something, I forget now, a lot of different dharmas floating around, but there was a way in which vimala appeared in a different state, a different correspondence. And now it's appearing as a correspondence to the fifth bumi, or the fifth bumi and the fifth paramita of dhyana in that way. Just a few quick words about vimala, this idea of stainless or flawless. Just to remind you that we are dealing with a bodhisattva. So we are dealing with bodhisattva wisdom, otherwise known as pranya, which is, of course, the next paramita on our list. But the idea is, is that because the bodhisattva is all about this wisdom and this wisdom of, in a sense, non-duality or something to that effect, what this word vimala refers to, well, in the original kind of Buddhist tradition, purity kind of referred to sort of having removed the stains of the poisons, having removed the stains and the flaws of the kleshas, right? Greed, anger, and delusion. But in the Mahayana tradition, the Bodhisattva path, they sort of have a very interesting twist on the idea of vimala or purity. And it's interesting, but the basic idea is, is that it's the unenlightened, deluded person that puts objects into the realm of pure, beautiful, good, and helpful, and other things in the category of useless, defiled, impure, bad, useless, right? The idea of the bodhisattva who has attained a state of vimala is that they don't do that. <laughs> in other words, it's a funny twist on the idea of purity in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, which is, oh, what is pure? Not putting things in categories of pure and impure. That's pure. And indeed, that might seem like a slight tautology, but it's not. <laughs> okay. Everybody feeling okay about those first five Dharani? <clears throat> Good because they just get longer and more complicated as we go. The sixth dharani that the bodhisattva attains upon entering the sixth bhumi stage, the sixth stage is called abhimukhi, the stage of manifestation. Amazing. This stage, the sixth stage, corresponds to the paramita of pranya, transcendent wisdom otherwise translated as non-dual wisdom in that sense. It's very close to the wisdom we were just talking about regarding purity and impurity. But the dharani that the bodhisattva attains here is actually called the pranya chakra dipa, the lamp of the, of the wisdom wheel, the wisdom wheel lamp. So a dipa, D-I-P-A, is a lamp, right? And our pranya chakra, our wisdom chakra, our wisdom chakra lamp. That's the idea behind this sixth uh, dharani 
again, it would be the Pranya Chakra Deepa Dharani. If, if, if we are sticking to the phonetic Sanskrit as relevant, significant, and important, we should remember Pranya Chakra Deepa, that it's called the Pranya Chakra Deepa. Shouldn't be a surprise since this is corresponding to the sixth stage, the sixth paramita, again, Pranya. Chakra, chakras are of course big in Buddhism. Uh, they don't necessarily refer to the chakras, although there are theories of course about the Dharma chakra being the idea chakra in that sense that it is corresponding to the chakras. However, you know, the word chakra in Buddhism, it has more, I don't wanna say more to do, but it has a lot to do with the idea of turning in a sense, which is just an interesting idea, turning unto itself. So chakra, I probably would be here all night if I started to go off about chakras. So pranya chakra deepa though, the lamp of the wisdom wheel. Well, let me, let me just say a few words about this because I do want to try to say something interesting about each of these. This stage, so remember that the stage is this abhimukhi, manifestation. And without, without trying to really like uh, make this too confusing, There's a basic way, and this is this is referring to a lot of Pranya Paramita Sutras. I'm referring right now primarily to the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra, but there's parts of the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra that they talk about it. The Buddha talks about and describes the Bodhisattva who has this Pranya, who has this wisdom. And a very interesting aspect to this pranya wisdom is, well, let's see. Okay. Here's the idea. This, this is a little um, thought experiment that I often like to walk people through. <laughs> and the thought experiment is about um, well, wherever you are right now, right? So I'm in this room and I have a number of different uh, lights on. You can kind of see the shadow of the lights, right? And because it's um, uh, June, I can also still get a little light from the window outside the door, right? So light from the setting sun and light from these lamps, they are illuminating the realm in which I am, and I can see and understand where I am and what's going on. I want you to sort of think about or imagine a dream you've had. And a very, very interesting question to ask oneself is, what's the source of illumination in a dream? Is it some dream lamp? Is it a dream sun? What is the source of illumination in a dream? The answer, of course, to that question is interesting. And to the Bodhisattva abiding in this sixth stage of manifestation that corresponds to the paramita of pranya, to that bodhisattva, the source of illumination in a dream and the source of illumination right here is the same source. And the bodhisattva who understands that, of course, attains this pranya chakra deepa, the lamp of pranya wisdom in that way. And the Vajra Sutra, again, does talk about this idea of the Bodhisattva. You know, in the Chinese, I'm, I often, I'm always translating the Vajra Sutra. I'm almost done. <laughs> but it's, it's a work in progress. 
And there's a beautiful section in the sutra where, it, in at least in Chinese, it says that the Bodhisattva develops eyes like sunshine. There's a really interesting line that says the Bodhisattva develops brightly illuminating sunshine eyes. And I can't think of a better name for a Bodhisattva than brightly illuminated sunshine eyes. But it's an interesting line in the sutra that has always kind of uh, piqued my interest. And I do have found other sources um, that confirm this idea I just dropped on you, that the source of illumination in a dream and the source of illumination right here are the same source. But to the degree to which we go back to the bifurcated subject-object relationship, then there will be lamps and the sun coming and hitting your eyes in that way. Yep. Durrani, number seven. So the Bodhisattva who attains the seventh stage attains a Durrani that is called the Sudarshana, the rare. So again, we have that term Sudarshana, rare or hard to see. But this is the Sudarshana Karita. Karita is the word for practice, uh, like a religious practice in that way, like a observance in that sense. The Sudarshana Karita is this the, pr the rare practice. And, you know, this is definitely one of those ones that you really need to know the paramitas and the, all of that. But of course, the seventh paramita corresponds to this paramita of upaya, skillful means. And I spent a whole night just on the idea of upaya. I like took a whole break from the sutra and just talked about this idea of upaya. In particular, I made it very clear that the seventh, eighth, ninth, and 10th stages, the upper stages, beginning with this seventh stage are very special bodhisattva stages. And it's basically, you know, the seventh stage of upaya is where the bodhisattva starts to employ upaya, skillful means, because they are now in the business of relaying their experience. They're kind of no longer students their teachers. And this can happen, you know, I think I said this probably that night, but when I say the Bodhisattva becomes a teacher, I don't necessarily mean a professor or a Dharma teacher. It's as, it's as simple as you've been studying Dharma, you've gotten into it, it has really, you know, turned you on or what have you, right? And you want to share it with somebody else. You, you know that there's something in this that has helped you. You know there's something interesting here and you now want to share it with somebody else. And you know that this stuff is tricky. You know that it's tricky to explain, but you want to do it. And so you figure out a clever way to explain to your friend who's, you know, maybe they're really into comic books and you employ some really great Avengers metaphor or some really great whatever metaphor that employs their superhero comic book mind. The idea is, is again, it's not about you being a professor or a Dharma teacher. It's just about your, you are now ready to share this because you're not just learning. This is the stage of Upaya where this is when the Bodhisattva starts doing that. And I would suggest that that is the Sudarshana Karita, that that's the rare practice is this, not just teaching Dharma, because again, it's not in necessarily in an official capacity, but it is about perpetuating the teachings in that way. And that's a rare practice, so to speak. Yeah. All right. The eighth paramita, or sorry, the eighth dharani corresponding to the eighth paramita, but the eighth dharani is the, mm, let's see, 
This is the one that I have yet to really nail down the back translation to the Sanskrit. It's either Pari Shuddha Vikalpa Dharani or just Shuddha Vikalpa Dharani. So I don't know if it needs the Pari Shuddha Vikalpa. What that term means, whether it's Pari Shuddha Vikalpa or just Shuddha Vikalpa, Shuddha Vikalpa, is purified or just pure discernment, vikalpa. So vikalpa, of course, this is the vikalpa mudra, this, the, the mudra of contemplation or investigation, as it's called, vikalpa. And this idea of pure discernment. This is a pretty classic Buddhist idea about being able to see things clearly, being able to reason about things clearly, and it would seem that the bodhisattva reaching this seventh stage, sorry, this eighth stage, attains this dharani of this shuddha vikalpa, right? Now, this paramita, or sorry, this dharani corresponds to the paramita of bala, or power, okay? And there's a kind of a very close association with bala or power and clear discernment, of course. Power, bala, it pretty much refers to the siddhis, the superpowers or super knowledges of a bodhisattva. And it's basically understood that you don't get to attain those superpowers or that super knowledge until you have attained that purified discernment. So. Um, yeah, that's pretty much that. Um, Sudha, this idea of Sudha is the purification. If you're familiar with the Visuddhimagga, that's the Pali text that's called the path or the Marga, the Maga of Visuddhi, of purification. Well, that Sudha, Visuddhi, that's the idea of this purification. And I've, I already mentioned it a few steps ago. I want to repeat it though. Early Buddhism was kind of obsessed with purification in a variety of ways. They were obsessed with purification of, of the um, afflictions, but they also were sort of very, um, or at least they are critiqued for being very judgmental about purity and impurity about things being pure and things being impure. And again, the Bodhisattva path and the whole Mahayana path, it's, it's sensitive to that early form of Buddhism. And it doesn't actually like that early form of Buddhism that got very puritanical. And so again, whenever you hear about purification or purity in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, it's very much about being purified of such <laughs> dualistic distinctions. And they're being very poetic and creative with their language by doing this funny twist on the idea of pure. And I think that there's a way in which if you miss the first part of that, it can start to sound like Buddhists are, again, even Mahayana Buddhists are very obsessed with purification when they're kind of actually not they're obsessed with actually not suffering. And suffering is impure in that sense. <laughs> and not suffering is pure in that sense. So, okay. Two more Dharanis to go. They both have big old long crazy names as real Dharanis should. So the ninth Dharani, which corresponds to the ninth stage. Uh, the ninth stage here is our subtle mind, our sadhu mati, which corresponds to the paramita of pranidhana, will or vow. Pranidhana is a tricky one. Refer all the way back to earlier sessions where we discussed that pranidhana. But the dharani that the bodhisattva attains upon entering or being in this ninth stage is called the Abhimukhi Ananta Dharma Paraya Dharani. Okay. 
So Abhimukhi is means manifestation. It's actually one of the stages back here, right? Abhimukhi means to appear, to manifest. Oh, what's that? So this is the Abhimukhi Ananta, which means boundless, limitless. Ananta Dharma Paraya. And the Dharma Paraya, Dharma Paraya are the Dharma doors. That's the Sanskrit word for Dharma doors. That's right. Our Sunday night Dharma doors we, in Sanskrit, we could be called the Dharma Paraya night. But Dharma doors, of course, are this idea of like Dharma entrances, Dharma gateways. And it's very interesting. I, I found this recently, which is you often find the Sanskrit idea or the Sanskrit word ananta boundless with the idea of the Dharma Paraya, the Dharma doors. And I started to notice it so often that I gave it some thought. You know, and there's a lot of ways of, you know, Buddhists, they love these adjectives, right? Incalculable, indestructible. And it would be one thing to say the incalculable Dharma doors. There's so many teachings of the Buddha, you can't count them all, right? So you could talk about the incalculable Dharma Paraya. You could talk about the invincible Dharma Paraya. You could talk about these Dharma doors a variety of ways. But I started to notice again that Ananta Dharma Paraya is like a phrase. And then it dawned on me. And this is just something I like to share. I'm not saying anything definitive about this, but you know, there's a very interesting way of thinking about doors, right? And you know, this is like, there's a famous line from that famous Chinese poem, the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, right? And Lao Tzu in his famous Chinese poem says that it takes wood to make a frame, but a doorway's usefulness comes from its, the space, right? And so it's interesting to think about a door as the bounded space. So what does it mean to talk about an Ananta Dharma Pariah, a boundless, hello, Jimmy, he got it. So boundless, just a big door in a sense, right? <laughs> so that is our ninth Dharani, this boundless Dharma door. And in fact, it is the manifestation of boundless Dharma doors, right? Abhimukhi Ananta Dharma Paraya Dharani. Again, these are starting to become mouthfuls. And actually, again, good Dharani should be a mouthful in that way. And finally, the 10th and last Dharani that the Bodhisattva attains upon entering the 10th Bhumi stage that corresponds to the 10th Paramita of Jnana, knowledge. The 10th Dharani is the Akshaya Dharma Garva Dharani. That's right, the inexhaustible Dharma treasury Dharani. Yeah. So the sutra is called Akshaya Mati inexhaustible. The final Dharani is called the inexhaustible, the Akshaya Dharma Garba. And the Garba is this idea of a treasury, a repository, even sometimes known as a womb, a Dharma womb, the inexhaustible Dharma womb Dharani. And indeed, I would suggest that this whole sutra is that inexhaustible Dharma treasury. And so that kind of lends a lot of uh, credence to this idea that these Dharanis are summaries, like Noam pointed out, summaries of the text in these compact little mnemonic remembrances in that way. So you might be able to read this that the, the Bodhisattva would walk away and just have to remember these 10 Dharanis. And from these 10 Dharanis, they could remember this entire sutra.
That's one way of understanding these Durrani's. Right. <laughs> and that's it, folks. We did it again. We went through the 10 stages just in time. Questions, comments, answers, ideas. All right. Um, then on that note, I just want to say, so this is pretty much going to be the second to last on this sutra. My plan is to wrap this up next week. There's only one little section of the actual sutra left. It is very much kind of a, uh, a coda in that way, an end piece. And so I'm going to more or less try to get through that next time and put this baby to rest, uh, as they say. Um, you know, don't quote me on that. One never knows, but that's our plan. Um, I hope you can be here next Sunday for that grand possible conclusion of the Aksayamati Bodhisattva Sutra. Until then, have a great night.